So how about talent? You know, everyone's talking about building talent, right? And, you know, we're going to have people that are going to talk about that the demand for new talent is nine to one, right? How do we get this talent? And we've never been at the crisis where mid-management talent is at the premium that it is today. And, you know, I go around the world and I talk in different regions and unemployment is 20% and I talk about, you know, the need for talent and the lack of talent and they look at me strangely, but it's a problem. So what I want to do is introduce you to Jake Barr and I go way back with Jake. Jake has always had a tremendous passion for talent. He was a leader at Procter & Gamble for over 20 years has actually been very instrumental in the industry for driving talent. So I want to bring Jake to the stage. And Jake, you have a panel of experts, which I'm real excited about. And what we've got is a couple of people that are going to talk about this dilemma and this perfect storm. Take it away. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I'll take that clicker. Yep, take me. that clicker. Well, good morning. Oh, come on now. It's only 11 o'clock. Good morning. OK. Here's the important piece about knowing this topic. We stand between you and lunch. That's it. No. Hey, Laura mentioned that uh, I actually spent 20 plus years. Lisa, I'm longer, younger than I look because it was 33 plus, but at Procter & Gamble. And I had the great pleasure working for a firm that was global in nature, as you heard from Lisa this morning, but lived virtually on every continent in the world. X1, which my son still reminds me to this day I haven't taken him to. The important point that I want to make to you is the lifeblood of our business models is people. It's that simple, folks. It's people. So it doesn't matter how great you are at your product or your service, but if you do not have the right quantity and quality of people, you're running a giant going out of business sale. It's fact. So I am honored today to actually present the topic to you, but I'm going to use the expertise and the knowledge, a number of people from across not only industry, but also in the academic and the professional education arena. And I think it's important for us to hear those aspects because all of them contribute to how we deal with what has been emerging. And I like to describe what's been emerging as the perfect storm. Because guys, for a series of years now, not just a single year, we've had an emerging talent issue. Now, if you don't really appreciate that by the time we go through what has been another fabulous piece of research by Laura and her team, then we fail. Because realistically, and I've done a cross check across a number of industry vertical leaders, in many cases right now, between 25 and 33 percent of your people are at or beyond retirement age out of your respective organizations. That is a problem. That is a pipeline issue that you cannot fix with one simple step. Now, as Laura knows me, I believe in the impossible. In fact, Lisa knows that we, we get paid at P&G to make the impossible possible every day. That's what we talk about in our supply chain, folks, because we truly do build and grow business leaders. And that's why I like to actually put the positive spin on it. Does anyone know who this is? Come on now. Don't have any surfers in the crowd? CJ. Kelly Slaughter. Slater. Slater. I'm sorry. I always butcher his name. <laughs> Kelly is a remarkable man. He is an 11-time world champion at surfing. He is not only an 11-time world champion at surfing, he actually won his first title at the age of 20. Oh, by the way, he won his most recent title at the age of 41. Now, the parallel to the talent piece is that Kelly is a student of his game. 
and he's gone completely to every corner of the planet in search of new ideas and techniques, investment in his trade, development of his craft, and it's kept him at the head of his game well beyond anyone in his peer group. In fact, he typically competes against individuals in the competitions that are less than half his age. Less than half his age. But what he's done is he's brought a diligence to the topic of understanding if I'm going to be good, I actually have to continue to invest in the skill base. Hang on to that thought because that's one thing we're going to share. So what we're going to do is share some top lines of the research that Laura and the team have most recently completed. Now because of time and we want to get you the experiences, we're not going to share all of it. So we're giving you a thumbnail sketch, but I, I encourage you to go back to her site and get into more details because, folks, this is something that if you really haven't had discussions with your chief supply chain officers and understood and took inventory of where you currently sit, and by the way, for those technology players in the audience, how you can actually help them overcome this impending perfect storm. Because truly, what the data is showing is we've reached the tipping point. We truly have reached the tipping point. So let me give you a backup. So what Laura did, has done is really gone out and canvassed the industry, cross industry verticals, to look for trends and, and not only just in the talent market itself about how you're using talent, but importantly, how people are changing and morphing their organization designs and the way that they're managing the talent and how the talent is even reporting. Where do they report to? Where are they getting their direction from? You've heard some of that earlier this morning. So let me give you a couple of quick top lines. Yes, again, for the third consecutive year, the number of companies that have all of their organization reporting into the C-suite has increased. Yes, again, all of them have continued to morph and take on more responsibility. Oops. Let's stop and think about that for a second. Not only are you giving them more accountability, by the way, that requires Philippe, where are you? More skill, right? But you're expecting them to be accountable for more of the operation. Now, if that's not a blending of a perfect storm, I don't know what is, because on top of that, most of these organizations for the first time are being, come, being brought in because of this business environment that Laura has referred to and been told, look, here is your number. We need this number to be generated because if you don't do that, we can't fund our next phase of growth, our next phase of expansion, our next phase of product and plant, our next phase of platform changes. So guys, the game has completely changed, not only in the context of the design of how the town is being used, the skills that they must possess, but the commercial linkage of what they must now be accountable for results-wise. Now, Lisa spoke to a bit of that this morning. She is a business leader at PNG. Yes, she has supply chain on her title, but she's a business leader. Now, another piece is to make sure that you understand that what Laura was doing was not just getting people that were out on the fringes. The people that participated in the most recent summary literally are large-scale operations. These are massive in size. And what you can take away from this is you should be very, very concerned because these folks actually are starting to wake up to the fact that they've got a problem. Now, let me translate that for you. Big companies who realize they have a problem, have a call to action, what do they do? They start changing. And in a constrained market for talent, they will beat you. So you're going to need to think about what strategies are you using to make sure you can at least acquire your fair share of that talent to address your own personal needs within your companies. Now, another key piece is Laura does a great job of making sure that when she goes and gets the data, she talks to decision makers. So she's really getting a good pipeline understanding of how people are looking at the topic and importantly, 
how they're planning to go and address it. So we're talking executive level input with senior titles and experience levels that we're contributing. Now, she talked to you about some of the business pains, but what I really want you to, to get clear in your mind about is, again, for the third year in a row, the talent issue crept up the list of the biggest pain points. So this was surveyed out to figure out, hey, what is the biggest problems you're having to deal with? Hmm, I can't really make sure I have the right people to be able to get the job done. Now, that would be great, but let's throw another one on top. Remember that piece I talked about between 25 and 33 percent are actually at or beyond retirement age? What roles do they fill for most of these companies? Well, they actually fill the operations leaders' roles, the ones that are accountable for making those critical trade-off decisions, the ones that are accountable not only for just transactionally executing the business, but actually keeping you ahead of the competitive set that you deal with. Guys, it's a trouble point because most firms today would punt and say, no problem, I'll fix that. I'll just hire more people on the front side. So who wants to play what I call Vegas odds? Okay, Because Laura gave you one number, and it varies a little bit by the industry vector, but the, right, the low end of the odds right now are six to one. Okay, Let me make sure you're clear on that. For every graduate that comes out with supply chain capability, there are six holes looking to be filled with that one candidate. Got it? Six to one. And that is as high as nine to one. Guys, you cannot stick your heads in the sand and believe that you're simply going to go be able to go hire new, bright, young, fresh people. There isn't a big enough supply. It doesn't exist right now. So looking ahead, let's say, oh, you know, that's been a nice sobering morning. This is obviously a blip on the radar and it's not going to continue. Well, hmm. when you ask those folks, executive level, well, how do you think you're doing versus your peer group? Wake up call, guys. Literally 34% say, I I'm losing this battle. I'm currently losing this battle. I'm, I'm not even staying on par. I'm losing. I'm losing to my peers. I'm losing to competition in the talent arena. Now, that would be somewhat manageable. But let's talk about what are the indices on turnover. Well, guys, the indices on turnover, look, third consecutive year, the level of turnover has increased. Not only has it increased, here's the more staggering and perplexing problem for you. For every hole you create, the hole stays empty longer. Third consecutive year, the duration of how long the vacancy stays empty has increased. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't call that a magic elixir for success. I call it another indicator of heading out of business. You cannot run the lifeblood of an organization, of a business model, without people to fill the critical tasks. Now, that would be, let's add one more layer to it. It would be great if the stats had said that, but then it would have been the easy roles to go recruit. Oh, sorry. The roles that are going unfilled are the ones that require the most technical expertise. I think you're starting to get the flavor of this. So guys, this is a major wake up call because the easiest roles to be procured are the ones that can be filled fastest, the ones that are the most important, and by the way, take the most brain power on the lower end of the quadrant there, are the ones where the turnover is increasing at a rapid pace and where the turnover stays open longer. Okay. Now, let's index and say, I can address that because I will do a masterful job of training the replacements that I get in. Oops, another gap. So what the, the study has shown again is the gap is widening on the number of companies that have put the proper investment in place to get the right kind of techniques in place to train and qualify the people that they're bringing in the door. 
So when you look at that, I like to correlate it and say, if the problem isn't big enough for you right now, do you have any professional help that's allowing you to address it? And what this basically gives you is a snapshot of how few organizations have really mobilized for the largest chunk. In most cases, the supply chain organizations are the largest user of human capital in any firm. But yet most don't have the expertise either on site or on staff to go help you aggressively day in, day out, deal with the tsunami, this large wave that we're talking about. So let's talk and just take a couple of looks at those. Now on the training aspect, you know what I really love, and every time that Laura does this, I get a great chuckle out of the lower left quadrant. Because when I get into the piece that I call, it says, desired and encouraged, but up to the individual. I laugh, because that means to me a big fat zero. Because it means, wait a minute, I've got under-equipped employees who aren't trained and qualified, who I look at and say, when you get time, get trained. Not a good elixir for success. Now let's look at the cross-training element, because again, the role and the expectations for what we're expecting them to be able to deliver has significantly changed. Again, not only just scope, but the type of work and the interactions and who they're accountable for for that. So I think, again, this year, you're seeing another change emerging in the skills that allow them to deal with those commercial interactions. So you're seeing the strategy and the finance and the distribution. I call it more the full supply chain leader skill base. That if you're going to be a supply chain leader in today's world, you, not only, you must be totally equipped. You know, I, I bless every day uh, at P&G that I spent because my first job with the company, because of my background, like Lisa, I was a finance manager. So I brought to the table all the financial training that I needed to be able to deal with the trade-offs and the analysis. But that is today's world for the folks that we have running the organizations. And so whether, again, you're in the, the operation or you're a solution provider, you've got to be speaking to how do you help them make these both visibility of the decisions that need to be taken and helping them to quantify what those are in a simplistic way so they can get on and act because that's what's got to occur. Now, the greatest gaps in cross-training come in the areas where most of these skills are starting to bubble up as being significant outages. You're being counted on to deliver the money for the expansions. You're being counted on to actually help with bringing the innovation to market faster than you've ever been able to do it in the history. And yet, you haven't been equipped with the skill sets to be able to do that. So, not a good elixir. So, I want to segue and then say, okay, obviously, Laura and her team has done a great job of gathering data. It's a microcosm of a set of companies across industry verticals. How about I ignore it? Because obviously it could just be a special cause. Well, let me give you two other little snippets. Okay? This just appeared a week ago in Money Magazine, defining the percentage of firms that are seeing turnover increases 51% of firms reported turnover increased this year versus last year, 51%. Now, the staggering piece is, guys, that, that was up from 30% last year. So 51% of firms are saying turnover has increased, okay? Second, here's a nice piece from our friends at, with IBM. I, I don't have a problem because I can succession plan my way through it. The majority of the organizations that they just recently surveyed don't even have succession plans in place for, for folks in mission critical roles. If Joe or Sally or Sue or Sam walk out the door this afternoon, what are we going to do? Guys, we're in an environment that I like to refer to as a giant going out of business sale because the factors and the way that all these elements have come together have put an absolute premium on the talent that is available to go and address these problems. 
And in many cases, most firms have been using very traditional methods to try and address the outages. Now, I believe you can stop and ponder for a second and take a different path. I actually believe there are some techniques that you can do that are very simple, that are tried and true, that the best in the business across industries have practiced and gotten success from. So I'm going to run through these quickly, and then I'm going to bring up the panelists and start peppering them with not only a few setup questions, but yours. So the first one I call cross-functional development. Now, Laura referred to it, but I describe it as, as simple. Just do it early and do it fast. So you can do it in two ways. You can take all of the new people that you plan to have come in in the next recruiting class, it might be as we speak, and designate them for a minimum of rotation through a set of assignments across your supply chain organization that could be on yearly intervals, could be two-year intervals. You pick it, whatever's appropriate. As Philippe likes to say, you know what, we, we've got the solutions, we just need to apply the techniques. Second, leadership development. You'd be amazed at how many companies say everyone coming in the door is competing to be the leader of the supply chain for the future. Really? Seriously. Quite frankly, you can very simply take your entire pool, divide it into three buckets. Bucket number one, individuals that you designate that you believe will have the mastery to be on a technical career path, and you're going to route them that way. Individuals, 10 to 15 percent, by the way. 10 to 15 percent that you believe have the ability to lead large scales or large scale organizations, numbering in the thousands of people and dealing with general managers, vice presidents, chairman of the boards of the future. And then the base of operation that's going to run the transactional machine. You could do it tomorrow. Third bullet, process standardization. Now, a lot of people have trouble with making the, the jump, but I think Philippe would also share with you, and, and from our Proctor experience, I can tell you, the more you can standardize down on process, the easier it is to be able to train, qualify, and move people through your system. When you have no process standardization, you have a zero-sum game. You're wasting every training energy, every new hire, every uh, person you bring in from the outside, because what you're getting is one-off implementations. Nothing that's sustainable. Fourth, what I call retrain and train re-engineering. If you're still using the age-old methods of sending people to classrooms for week-long, uh, web-based techniques, online qualification, by the way, simulations that you can run where you can prove whether they can either run a physical plant machine or a planning process, all of those actually exist and are plentiful for you to grab if you want to take them today. And then finally, what I call challenge early risk and reward. I'm going to give you a paradigm shift. A lot of people talk about developed and developing countries. I'm going to tell you that in the talent world that we live in, you're going to have to flip it upside down in the next three to five years for North America and the developed world and Western Europe. Because with this 25 to 30 percent chunk of the population that's going to walk away, you're going to be forced to develop and rotate people like you would if you were in China, Brazil, Egypt, someplace else. Quick, short-hitting assignments, specific detailed responsibility, and then rapidly increasing their scope. You're just simply not going to be able to get the pipeline you need otherwise. Now, at this point, I'd like to invite the rest of the panelists up on the, the stage, and we're going to quickly have them walk you through who they are, what role they play, and then importantly, we're going to get into some very practical pragmatic experiences of what they personally have seen from their venue. You were wondering if I would take the cushy chair? I was. And we have symbolically left a chair empty on stage. Not because it's for me, it's cushy. It's because we're a man down. We're a person down. Realistically, if you look at Laura's data and if you walk away from what she's trying to tell you with the data today, 
You've got an absence, a vacancy in the organization that's costing you money today. Have you really pondered the full cost? Let me give you two uh, recently published statistics on outages. It takes the equivalent of 80% of the fully loaded salary and benefit costs to train and qualify an individual that's coming in the door to do their base work. You get that? 80%. That's been validated through some studies. It actually takes 200% of the fully loaded costs to actually bring someone in to fill after you lose them. You get it? So the rate of return, the ROI is actually higher if you can keep them. So let's start by going down the panel. I want to make sure you meet my colleagues because they have a, a, an amazing uh, background and experience based off you. So let's go left, from left to right. Joe? Sure. Joe Krakowska, I'm with Dow AgroSciences. Uh, that's a business unit inside the $60 billion Dow Chemical Company. We're about a $7 billion uh, unit with about 7,000 employees overall, and I'm responsible for supply chain in that organization. Uh, Cindy Urbatis, Managing Director at the Institute of Supply Management. Um, we are now a four customer segment based organization, and I oversee the strategy and vision for the emerging professional and the established professional, which is that mid management group. Good morning. My name is Patrick Curry, and I'm with uh, IBM. And I manage talent development for the integrated supply chain as well as university relations. How many employees again, Patrick? I lose track. It's, well, for the supply chain, it's 25,000. There we go. Okay. And good morning, everyone. Nick Little, Assistant Director of Executive Development Programs in the Eli Broad College of Business at Michigan State University. And my role is very much to bridge the gap between academia and practitioners. Okay. So we've assembled two industry leaders from different industries for you. One individual from a highly well-respected top five it all depends year to year, right, Nick? Whether it's number one or number two. Institution from a supply chain degree format. And then Cindy, who brings the professional development aspect of the fact that just because you bring them into the organization, just because you bring them into the, the specialty of supply chain, they still need cultivation, right? So let me pose the first question to the panel. We're gonna go from Joe left to right. Does the data surprise you from the most recent survey? Is there anything that just jumps out at you? It, it did at first. It, you know, the, the first exposure to it, I think, uh, was surprising to, to me and our particular business unit. We have this benefit of being inside the larger Dow, and so filling positions in the short term felt relatively easy. Um, but the more I studied the data and thought about it, and thought about this issue of the number of people leaving and the time it takes to get people on board and productive, uh, and then the geographic difficulties, the technology difficulties, uh, I think what's happening in my particular business is we, we don't have a big problem today, but we've got one that's uh, brewing, and I think it is as significant as you've outlined. Cindy, what are your thoughts? Well, actually, I was very happy that the data that we have uh, matched what Laura had found as well. Um, the, there is a problem, and it is very significant. Um, CAPS Research, which is a part of our research organization, found that among their corporate um, members, that 70% of them said that they are having um, leaving positions unfilled, not because of a hiring freeze, but because of the lack of talent. So if you have that many openings out there and they're not being able to fill them, then there's obviously a gap. Patrick? When I saw the data, I said, oh, really? Um, I wasn't surprised at all. When uh, I came into this job, we had decided we hadn't been in the supply chain uh, hiring for a couple of years based on the uh, economic downturn, and we had a freeze on hiring. Um, our general manager made the determination that we have to get some vitality into the organization. So we figured out a way to do that. And we were late to the game, quite honestly, in recruiting. We had to get our recruiting muscles back up. And what was interesting is some of the universities that we normally do business with and we have great relationships with were sold out. They had zero supply chain skills for us. 
Uh, we normally work with 14 universities where we do projects and curriculum building as well as recruiting. But in order to, to meet um, the target hiring this, this past year, we had to go to 35 universities and actually spread out the, um, the degrees. So I'm not surprised at all. Amazing. IBM found that they were sold out when they went. Guys, this, this thing is not a one-time phenomenon. This is, again, a brewing big issue. Nick, obviously, you've got more graduates than you can find jobs for, right? I, I, absolutely not. We have <laughs> the exact opposite. Um, the data doesn't surprise me. We first noticed this seven or eight years ago, and the problem's actually been getting worse. Our graduates are oversubscribed. They're able almost to dictate salaries. The graduates that come out of our full-time MBA program with a supply chain option and the undergraduates that we uh, graduate, they both get better starting salaries than the equivalents in finance and marketing. Mm -hmm. So supply chain is in demand. It's in demand big time. They have tremendous futures in front of them. The problem is there's a constraint in the system. There's not enough of them coming out. There's not enough people to teach them. There's not enough universities that are offering really good supply chain programs that meet the requirements of recruiters. So one of the things we've got to do is change our game to meet that demand and treat it very much like a supply chain. At the moment, it's an old fashioned push process. Mm -hmm. It's got to change. Nick, are you saying collectively across the industries, we haven't actually provided you a demand forecast to how many people you need to deliver? Yeah, isn't that strange? You know, we, Unbelievable. Demand, not only in terms of quantity, but also I'd say in quality as well. Ah. What are the topics you really need us to teach? And how can we update our programs to do that? So Cindy, the training aspect of existing people that are in the supply chain, talk to me about the trends that you're seeing. Well, the trends that I'm seeing um, are, are not very positive as well because we also found that the average company spends about $650 per person per year on training. So I was just looking at the cost of attending this seminar. They wouldn't be able to attend this. So that gives you an idea of how much training the company is actually providing to these individuals. But as we've heard, the increased roles, responsibilities, all these additional skills we're looking for, and uh, I think, well, it was one of the uh, charts that you showed Jake, that um, you know, they're leaving it up to the individual. And if there's no support there, if there's no encouragement, mentoring, it's just not going to happen. So that's what we're, that is what we're seeing with companies. So Joe, you, you talked about some of the gaps. So what techniques are you trying to apply right now within Dow? Well, a, a couple of them come to mind that I, I consider uh, unique and targeted at this particular problem. W one of them is recognizing that we're probably not going to stop people from retiring, but we might be able to convince some of them to hang around a little bit longer and uh, consciously focus on mentoring uh, the incoming talent. And so uh, we've put some uh, HR programs together that make it a little easier for retirees to stick around after they retire or to delay retirement, and we're talking about that a lot more as a company. Um, that, that, I would say, is probably one of the most important things we'll do because uh, this gap that we're seeing, one thing you didn't talk about is we went through this period of productivity and efficiency focus. And so maybe that's always the focus, but for a while there, downsizing companies was the thing to do. And so if you looked at that void in the population, you've got even if you had enough talent coming in from the university, they're going to have to accelerate like crazy to get to the level that you need to, them to perform at. And so this combination of retirees, that gap, how rapid we're going to have to accelerate, that's a space that we look at quite a bit and build into our HR programs and talk about that performance and potential and how do we develop people in terms of next assignments. We're doing that a lot more consciously than we have in the past. Yeah, in fact, uh, back to some of Philippe's comments this morning around the transformational aspect of some of the firms that he's worked for, as well as some of the stuff that uh, P&G's gone through. number of even my own personal clients, I, I'm literally counseling them as they go through transformational change steps. So they're in the midst of a large organizational redesign on how they're going to manage a certain piece of work. 
I actually coach them through how to, di to direct a small slice of that talent that they're going to take out to actually reinvest back into their base so that they can actually accelerate. Because most are going to say, I really don't have the people to actually invest in the area to get the expertise up. Well, wait, you're just in the midst of going through a transformation. So let's specifically on target from a strategy standpoint, make that call now. So Patrick, talk to me about you've gone, you went through a couple of years where you had no new influx. Well, obviously, I mean, your system is very technically based. So how did you fill the gaps? So <clears throat> we, we had to focus on skills. Um, we went to universities that had both graduate and undergraduate degrees in supply chain. And again, a lot of these universities were sold out. So as we expanded, we expanded taking a look at skills that we needed, right? So um, we, we looked at um, skills in finance, or we looked at um, skills in business management. We, um, we overhired in engineering, and engineering has been traditionally where a lot of supply chain talent came from. Um, now we are now working with the schools to help not only to develop the pipeline, um, but also develop the curriculum. Because what we're finding is that some of the curriculum is not, you know, because it's new. It's not up, up right. to what we're actually doing. Um, and one thing we're doing, we're actually stepping back even into the high schools now. And taking a look at, um, locally anyway, um, taking a look at some of the STEM high schools, and there are some in uh, the Raleigh-Durham area, and talking to the counselors and saying, hey, this is, a, this is a, an option, right? So no one's talking about um, supply chain as an option. I was at a university on Monday, um, and we're doing a supply chain day. And a lot of the kids that came over, and this was in the business school, um, said, tell me about supply chain. Are you in it? No. But tell me about it. You guys are the only ones here. Tell me about supply chain. And I mean, kids just don't know it's an option. Yeah, I want to give uh, some credit to both Nick and Cindy, among others. Uh, they work as part of a uh, cross-industry collaboration called the Supply Chain Talent and Academic Initiative. And they recently, it's been about a year ago now, published the first ever summarized salary and compensation grid for supply chain professionals. It actually provides those that are in guidance counselor roles and in the secondary schools and high schools and even in college um, to actually provide coaching to kids around what a career could look like because kids are, unfortunately, they're interested in what, what will it yield monetarily and does it make sense for me versus some other career choice, right? All right, guys, I'd like to switch and talk about, but we've quantified the problems are real and they're growing. They're not getting smaller. And this is a zero sum game right now because we just simply aren't getting enough in the pipeline to support filling the jobs. So what other creative things have you been doing locally within your organizations to actually bridge that gap, either retraining new innovative techniques of your retraining existing employees or trying to do organizational design changes to step into the fray. What have you been doing? Joe? Well, one of the things that maybe supplements the earlier question is how do we approach uh, training and development in any given individual? And one of the things that I think is getting talked about quite a bit these days is this 70-20-10 issue and um, you know if you looked at how we design training perhaps you know 20 years ago or 10 years ago and then you recognize you're short on people and then you recognize that adults learn 70 percent of what they learn while doing it you can actually paint a, a favorable picture there to say what we really need to do is focus less on getting the website up and all the procedures in place and focusing more on getting experienced talent shadowing or nearby uh, the new talent. So 70-20-10 is a piece of it. Uh, developing specific awareness and visibility of where we have expertise gaps. So uh, in our case, for whatever reason, international trade, international compliance seems to be an area that no matter where we're at globally, that's a tough role to fill, especially in the mid-level management positions. Um, 
looking at regional strategies. So uh, we're, we're blessed that in North America and in Europe, we seem to have a machine up and running in terms of recruiting and identifying top universities, Michigan State being one of them. Uh, Penn State, by the way, being another Nick, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and making sure that we go to these targeted universities looking for specific students and skills and profiles. Um, so, so technology or expertise plans, regional plans, uh, 70, 20, 10, and how you partner people uh, to try and bridge this gap, and, and maybe most of all, just invest, investing my own personal time in it, in things like people teams or HR teams to make sure that uh, it's viewed as something that matters a lot. Yeah. Cindy, what are you seeing? Well, what I'm seeing is, um, you know, you look at supply chain, the roles of supply chain, and it's very complex, it's very diverse. There's, you could probably look at any organization and there would be very few similarities. It's one of job descriptions, job functions. It's almost an impossible task for the universities, any of them, to look at that broad spectrum and create content and curriculum that's gonna address all those needs. Um, Patrick mentioned business acumen and finance as being some of the, and being able to think strategically some of the top three items that are missing. It's, and those are things that are hard to train regardless. So we're looking at, you know, right now ISM is a developing program. We have some programs in place to address that. And um, so some of the other things I'm seeing is organizations, they don't know how to tackle this whole idea of talent because it is so complex. So they are actually just not outsourcing the training of it, but outsourcing the whole management of their talent management within their organization. So you can look at, look where the gaps are, build content around that, it's an ongoing and through coaching um, and a number of other sources cont that continuous improvement occurs. So, so those are some of the things that we've been doing. So Patrick, this speaks to your life, brother, man. There is, there is no big blue without this. Yeah, you know, um, I guess what I would say what we're doing that's unique is focusing on it. Um, in IBM, this, this role that I have does not exist anywhere else. And we have, you know, you have, there's some focus in, in HR, but uh, for a line organization to have uh, someone that's looking at talent management as well as um, working with the universities to help develop the pipeline, we don't have that. Um, our strategy is it's sort of like and I, it was no it was interesting when i saw the picture and he had talent at the bottom well we don't say talents at the bottom and that's where we have it talent it's the foundation of everything we do talent. and so um, my role is really um, to ensure that employees are engaged at all levels throughout not only the strategy but understanding the strategy because that's really the why of the what that we do and we have six talent programs and these talent programs run the gamut. Now, some of it, um, it is voluntary, some, some of it. Now, some, you know, we have three, three programs that's for everyone. We have a couple that you have to be nominated for. And then we have one talent program just for management, just for the mid-level yeah. management. And, you know, one of the most unique uh, programs that we have, we call it the Global Buddy Program. And what it is, you know, traditionally, you could say it's a mentoring program, but it's, um, it's, it's a little more than that. Right, so it's one-to-one -one mentoring as well as one-to-many, which we call knowledge buddies, to help share um, with, with a group that could teach a class uh, or on a call. And then there's collaboration where it's many-to-many. -many. But what's unique about it is you sign up and you say, I want to know more about fulfillment. And we will match you up with a buddy that's normally in another country. And so you get both the global aspect of um, business as well as um, the functional part. Mm -hmm. And in this summer, when we had our interns, and I talked with every one of them uh, on the way in and on the way out, they all looked different on the way out. Um, but, but each one said the biggest learning was the global aspect of business, that they talk about in school, and, but it's, it's different when you're talking to someone from China or Brazil or having a call at 12 o'clock at night. And so they had a be better understanding. Yeah. Nick, let me follow up on that for just a second um, and ask you your opinion about something because I think a piece that gets lost in the discussion is this changing nature of our business models. So the need to actually not only invest in the new talent coming in, but actually go back and invest in the talent that's already there. Because what we've done is we've changed the game on them 
after we brought them in the door and we're expecting different outcomes, different skills, different. So talk to me about the professional nature of what you do at Michigan State as well. Well, certainly um, one of the key aspects we cover is continuing education, to give it a, an umbrella name. And what that involves is actually helping people who may be new entrants to a senior or middle management supply chain position understand what it's about and also helping people who are in it for a career to be able to understand what a lot of the new developments are, whether they're strategic, technical, application, whatever it may be. Some of that will be based on research that the university does. Others will be based on best practices that we see. So there are a number of different offerings that are available. And it's not just Michigan State that does this. Most uh, of the leading schools will do it. We'll offer any sort of uh, program. We'll come to a company, we'll customize something for their specific needs aimed at their target population that they need to grow. Uh, we will do open enrollment programs. We do online programs. And in the future, I see that there's going to be a vast increase in the number of online learnings that are available for people to follow according to where they see or where they're advised that they've got gaps in their knowledge and experience. The university's got a big, big role to play in that, as have a lot of uh, training organizations and consultancies as well. Yeah, so I want to tie together a couple of dots here of what we've talked before because we've talked about not only there being a gap in the positions, there's this impending wave that's going to leave the middle management positions open that require far more experience and expertise. But a lot of folks are taking the single, what I call the single solve equation. They're looking at the universe with the data points they have within their own box as opposed to redefining the boundaries of the box for how they can get a targeted solution to this. So with a very simple technique of identifying that you've got 15 key positions, perhaps as a, as a number to throw out, that are gonna go empty in the next two to three to five years. And then actually going back and saying, we're actually going to pre-identify the set of candidates that we want in those roles. And then we're gonna put them through one of these professional education elements to bridge the gap so that by the time they arrive, they're fully functional. They're not having to try and learn on the fly or in that big pie chart. Well, learn the best you can, right? All right, so at this point, I'd like to turn it to the audience and I'd like to see if we can get them to pepper you with a couple of their own questions. Over here on the right. Uh, do you have any things coming from SCA Technologies? Oh. Thank you. Um, so you talked about continuing education and the importance of that. And But what I've seen now, I, 10, 15 years ago, um, it was very common for companies to pay for MBAs, for instance, and continuing education. Uh, I worked for Bayer at the time. They paid six figures for me to get my MBA from Carnegie Mellon University. And I'm not seeing that today. That's almost entirely gone away. Um, there are big limits on the amount that, that uh, companies are generally willing to spend for an MBA, for instance. So what it means is the people that do get the MBAs get them from kind of the lesser universities because that's all they can afford. Um, so uh, let me ask you, I mean, what do you see? I mean, that, that's my ex personal experience. Is that what people are seeing throughout the country? And um, with that in mind, I, I mean, given the idea that um, education and experience kind of have to go hand in hand and that education means a lot more when there's some experience behind it and that experience means a lot more when there's some education behind it and it's kind of this this iterative process of education and experience do, do you think that that's a gap and and why does industry seem to be moving away from that model I can, uh, i'll start that um at ibm we did change um it used to be more open for you to get an MBA um, and without a lot of controls around it. We put a little more controls around it and now it's, it's even more controls. But we, we still pay for MBAs, but there's a nomination process and it's not school dependent. So we're, we're still uh, getting folks MBAs at Duke University, Michigan State. Um, we do want the better programs. We even found a new program at the University of Tennessee, which is, um, focus on supply chain. And it's not a cheap option. Um, we're, we're looking for a better option.
But, but we do focus on um, high potential employees that we think will stay, right? Because it is, um, you know, I, I get my MBA paid for, but I don't work for that company anymore. And, um, and maybe a couple other folks in the room. <laughs> but so, so we're trying to, um, trying to um, avoid that, right? So we, we do want in our supply chain the right employees. So we, we, do, we do value that. I'm seeing a combination of where firms are actually um, targeting the use of that more because of just general cost constraints and making sure they're getting the biggest rate of return to either high potential employees that they've already designated as part of their succession plan, right? Mm -hmm. And or triggering the fact that the degree or the additional professional education must be directly tied to what specifically is required to be exceptional at the job in question, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just I can go out and get a, you know, a whatever, a, an advanced degree. It has to mm -hmm. specifically tie, because again, the, what they're looking for is, am I going to be able to get that boost that I'm looking for, for the reason for the investing of the money? Okay, other questions over here. Looking at the panel, I'm wondering how many of you actually got a degree in supply chain management. I know I didn't. I got to learn that. So the question is really. <laughs> Thank God you had one. <laughs> <laughs> the, the question is really, what is it that we think is central to that need for supply chain management? Because I did engineering, and then I went and uh, did some courses in the business school. Yep. Um, they didn't know what integration was and differentiation and the, the data analytics that are so central to supply chain was just completely absent in the business school. Right. Whereas I did, couldn't have read a financial statement if you put one in front of me. I can now, but I had to learn it myself. So what is that combination of skills that we think are so central to that person that we call a supply chain management? So we'll answer the question for you, Trevor, but I think to be fair, uh, again, as, as Laura's chronicled it, while we're celebrating 30 years of the discovery of the journey of supply chain, the reality is it really has been maturing over the last five to seven. So most of the degree programs really didn't exist before that, right? But I think you're quite, the core of your question, we're gonna answer that, which is, hey, what are, the, what are the really critical skills? So we'll go down the panel. If there are only two skills, Joe, that you could make sure someone's arriving to work and have available to work in the supply chain, what are they? Only I, two, I, Joe. I, I, don't, I, I don't know. Probably, uh, probably international trade and planning. Okay. Um, finance and communication. Uh, I would say analytical skills and, and ability to, to communicate. Well, I'm going to add to the communication one because I see that as absolutely critical. But the other one is a strategic viewpoint. Yeah. And for me, the two are not only the analytical skills, but the ability to look above the problem to the bigger solution. Because it's easy to get people that are great prop localized problem solvers, but they're working on a task that has no consequence that in the end game, they shouldn't even be working on that at all. They should have been stepping back and asking the bigger question. That, and you tend to find that with a lot of inexperienced players across the industries in the supply chain. They're reacting, saying, well, I've got this issue, and I've got this scrap rate, and I've got the, well, what, what, what's causing? Well, it's because of that machine. Well, is it, or is it because you've got bad material coming from a supplier off quality? So it gets back to, I think we would agree, it's analytical, in nature, there is definitely, because of what the survey is showing us, a greater propensity and need for strong interpersonal and communication skills. The ability to go sell the disruptive change that is required to deliver upon the commercial expectations, right? And as without what Laura was referring to as burying them in the acronyms and terminology of the supply chain. Jake, fact, can I add one more? Yeah, thing? go ahead. I just, I, in answer to your question, um, there's a trend of one. Pfizer actually, um, I was, 
for their new hires are not looking at MBAs any longer. They're looking at more of the generalist because they feel that they're, they're more manageable. They can uh, develop them in the way that they would like. They don't have these set views. Um, and the expectations are a little bit lower. Because um, when you want, uh, you know, you're hiring an MBA, six figures, versus a generalist, you could bring that down a little bit. So that's, that's a trend of one, though. <laughs> okay. So I'd like to, I'll take one final question, then we'll close. So I saw three hands go up, I think. Right? Mark, Mark Walrath from Colgate. What, the strategies for finding and seeking talent outside of North America and Europe have to be very different. What's the point of view on that? Okay, let's go down. I've got some personal experience with that. Yeah, same, same here in terms of personal experience. And, and I'll, I'll start with, yes, I agree with you. Uh, it, it is different. The, the level of talent dr varies dramatically. But I think the uh, principles stay the same. Uh, you have to partner with a university that has a reputation for training solid candidates, and then you have to, you know, use your network and use your plan. Well, Europe is a little bit easier, but when I look at Asia, it's very difficult. They don't have the supply chain discipline in their universities. There may be one or two. Fudan is the one that comes to mind. It's probably the top in China. Um, it's very difficult there. The average age of the worker in China and India is 26. You don't have this legacy. Um, this morning I heard that there are very few ex expats in place anymore. So it's not like you can just go down the hall and say, well, talk to so-and-so. They'll be able to help you out because that doesn't exist. Uh, it's a, it, the uh, training and development of the individuals there are very important. But the plus side is that they're very eager to learn. So. Yeah, so for major markets, it's, it's similar to what we do in the U.S., um, and I, I would agree, it's a little easier in major markets. and growth markets, they are younger, and we are continuously hiring in the growth markets, and we develop them. Now, the downside is um, we're training some folks for our competitors, and so we, we, we're trying to keep them engaged and move them around a bit, um, but the approach uh, in growth markets, you know, is y bring them in young and train them up. So, Mark, I give you uh, just one closeout thought on it. It, it um, kind of rule of thumb that we had used in those markets is default first on technical mastery. So, think about that as higher analytical type skills because you can always teach the boundary edge skills. You can't teach if they have a gap on the computing power. Right? So, I'd like to th close out with two thoughts for you. First, Guys, this problem has been a wave that's been growing literally for the last five years in most of the industry work that I had done previously with Nick and Cindy and others. But it's really getting to a tipping point. It's at the point where if you haven't physically addressed that within your firms, the time to do so is now. Second, there are techniques that are a step change, an opportunity for you to leapfrog. You do not have to train or try and qualify people in the methods of your grandfather or grandmother. You have that opportunity. There are methods, online, uh, web-based simulation games. It's available. You may not have the access to it. I want to encourage you to use both the individuals that have been on the panel here this morning, and there's a couple of industry uh, committees that you can le reach out to that you can find as well. So I'd like you to join me in thanking the panelists this morning for their time. Thank you. And we'll turn it back over to Laura. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jake. I always love when you lead a panel. And thank you, guys. I uh, have a lot of thanks for everyone up here in terms of what you've done for talent. We will get back after lunch at 1.30 and want to bring it back promptly because we've got two really cool topics. Corporate social responsibility as a brand differentiator and how do we imagine a different healthcare supply chain. Now when you go to lunch, you're going to see that on each of the tables there's a topic. And so we're asking you to join with the table that most interests you, whether it's talent or big data or corporate social responsibility, find a table topic that you really want to connect with. The lunch period is designed with an hour and 15 minutes to allow you time to network. 
spend time talking. You don't get much opportunity to talk to the folks that are of this supply chain talent that are in this room. We'll see you back. Thanks very much, and see you back at 1.30.